Uh, I think this is a really exciting uh, panel. And the idea of this panel is really to think about, well, what's the, what are the next steps? You know, there's this really interesting uh, experiment with the Cali California-Quebec linkage. And uh, what are the lessons of this experiment for, uh, for other countries, other places? Uh, my, my own research is on, on China and uh, environmental regulations, so I'm very interested in what these speakers have to say about uh, the lessons to be learned from this experiment and, and the applicability for other uh, countries. And so um, <clears throat> I'll just very briefly introduce them. You have the, the detailed bios in the, uh, in the materials, but uh, I'll introduce them in the order that we've asked them to, to speak. So Mark Wenzel is the uh, climate, change climate change advisor at California EPA, and in that capacity does a lot of uh, work with uh, partnerships with other countries. Uh, we have Erica Morehouse from uh, Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, she's based in San Francisco. Uh, and then we have Mark Jackard uh, from Simon Fraser University uh, coming to us from Vancouver, and Eric LaChapelle from the University of Montreal. And they'll all speak about this from different uh, angles. Um, and uh, I'm looking very much forward to what they have to say. So uh, with that, let's give them a round of applause. And, uh, and then very quickly, in terms of format, well, what I've asked them to do is to each speak for about 10 minutes. Then I'll lead off the discussion with just one or two questions. And then we'd really like to open it up. And we've saved plenty of time for some back and forth exchange, which is. Hi, thanks. I'm uh, really pleased to be here. Many thanks to the conference organizers for having me. I'd like to think that I was invited for my insights, but I do have a little bit of a suspicion that I was here to fill out the Mark, Mark, Eric, and Erica panel. <laughs> but you're stuck with me, so you'll get some insights anyway. Um, you know, as we look forward, I wanted to sort of broaden the conversation around linkage, uh, talk about uh, exportable policies in California, including cap and trade, but not limited to cap and trade, uh, and uh, then look specifically at linking uh, and some of the uh, broader conversation that's happening uh, locally and internationally around that. Uh, and, you know, auditioning for the law school here, I'll argue both sides a little bit. So in addition to some, I think, really optimistic things I have to say, you may, may hear a word or two of caution in there. So as I said, you know, uh, when we think about policies in California, Michael Gibbs made the point this morning that we designed our policy to be uh, adopted by as many jurisdictions as possible. And the idea of exportable policies or ones that can be more broadly applied is one that we use in, in all of the programs that we look at. So we have a few examples here of uh, where California policies have had a, a bigger impact outside the state. Uh, you know, David Rosenheim reminded me at lunch that maybe reporting is an even earlier example of this where the California Climate Action Reserve uh, got, uh, I'm sorry, registry got turned into the, the climate registry, which became sort of the, uh, the U.S. and Canadian standard for uh, reporting greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have clean car standards, so, so that was the Pavley Bill in 2002. They were adopted here in California, eventually matched by the U.S. federal government, and then the Canadian government, federal government matched those standards as well. So that's a case where the California policy really uh, became the foundation for a North American policy with much bigger impacts for a uh, fuel economy, uh, reduction of uh, imports of, uh, of oil and greenhouse gas benefits. Uh, another example we have is the Low Carbon Fuel, fuel Standard, or LCFS, uh, which has also been adopted in British Columbia and in Oregon. Uh, we have uh, a lot of activity here in California around uh, zero emission vehicles, mostly electric cars. I hope you've seen them on the roads. So that's uh, due in part to a mandate we have in California that uh, auto manufacturers have to sell a certain percentage of their cars as uh, zero emission, zero tailpipe emissions. Uh, which is so far electric cars, and then starting this spring, it'll be some hydrogen vehicles as well. Uh, in California, we really have an ecosystem around this, so the government's really pulling very actively. We have the uh, auto manufacturers. We also have the equipment suppliers. Uh, we have uh, several NGOs, not just the environmental advocacy organizations, but also trade organizations and others that are really all uh, helping to build uh, the infrastructure in the broadest sense for uh, zero emission vehicles. Uh, and we're trying to help some of the other states in the U.S. develop a similar infrastructure to really build the markets and build the capacity uh, for ZEVs. And then uh, 111D came up er earlier, so there uh, is the Clean Air Act, and we have uh, done a lot of uh, communication and outreach with other states to uh, represent state positions uh, to the U.S. EPA on what those regulations for existing power plants ought to look like. 
and uh, we've emphasized state flexibility and recognition of early action for those states who have taken uh, actions already. So this idea of, uh, of expansion of policies uh, is one that is not limited to cap and trade, but is really part of something that we try to do throughout our climate and air quality policies. Uh, I'd like to point specifically to, to, to some outreach, narrowing it in a little bit on climate now. So we have the uh, climate change outreach. The Pacific Coast Collaborative is a group of five Pacific jurisdictions. And in October of last year, four of them, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California, signed the Pacific Coast Action Plan on Climate and Energy, uh, which had a, a number of, uh, of different pledges in it from the, the uh, three governors and the premier, uh, including one on pricing carbon. So this is, uh, was referred to this morning, but the governors of Oregon and Washington both committed their states to pricing carbon, which is really exciting, and there's a lot of activity going on, uh, going on in those states uh, right now, and we're working with them on that. Also collaborating around long-term reduction targets, uh, low-carbon fuel standards, uh, more on zero-emission vehicles, and then there's a whole suite of things that we're implementing, and I encourage you to, to look at the uh, full document if you're interested. Uh, BC was the one who put it, uh, put it in the uh, nice format, so they have a little gold braid around the outside. Uh, I will warn you that it's, uh, it's legal size and not letter, and so I've more than once printed out three quarters of the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so then we, in addition to uh, looking at things domestically, and, and no offense, we consider Canada mostly to be our domestic policy, but we're also looking, uh, reaching out internationally. We have memorandums of understanding with the, the Chinese national government, the National Development and Reform Commission, which is uh, sort of their macroeconomic planning agency and is in charge of their federal uh, climate policy. We also have uh, low carbon development uh, MOUs that we've uh, signed with Guangdong province, Jiangsu province, and the city of Shenzhen. And we have uh, an MOU with Peru that's broader ranging but has a climate, uh, a climate change line in there. We also, the governor recently signed an agreement with uh, Israel, which has uh, no specific reference to climate, but there is a clean energy development piece in there, which we think, uh, of course, very much in the spirit of what we're trying to do with climate change here. We have a letter of intent with the Netherlands uh, uh, on ZEVs and on um, climate change. And then uh, the governor mentioned in his State of the State address, uh, we will go to Mexico next. So we're actively talking with the federal government in Mexico, as well as with, with some of the subnational jurisdictions there about what opportunities there might be for mutual benefit in the climate space. So we, uh, we're, we are really very active uh, here and we are trying to uh, uh, be models and share information where we can. So uh, going just uh, one step farther in on, uh, on linking specifically, uh, in a lot of these national and international conversations about linking, it's sort of assumed that we know what linking is. And that might be uh, the link that we have with Quebec, which is uh, sort of the classical form of a link in which you have two uh, programs that are intensely harmonized. Uh, and then those programs have full fungibility of instruments. Uh, but as you expand out a little bit from that, you find that there are many conversations uh, uh, that assume slightly different meanings for linking and the implications of linking and the definition of linking. So I'd like to point out a couple of them here. Uh, and the first is, is just to note that uh, with that traditional form of linking where all the instruments are fully fungible, what you have is, uh, is harmonization regardless of whether or not your regulations are harmonized or are written to be exactly the same way. And that's because if the allowances or, and offsets can flow from one program to another, then there are smart people out there who will figure out the, uh, let's call it the lowest common denominator. And they'll act uh, to make that feature of the program, whether it's part of price containment or banking or borrowing or uh, permissible sorts of offsets, they'll make that the de facto uh, regulation uh, in all programs. And so that's, uh, that's the, the reason that we've really focused on this classical link with harmonization, which is that our programs are essentially identical with some differences, as Jean-Yves pointed out, where there are things we agree there could be more flexibility where it didn't impact the, uh, the environmental integrity or the uh, competitiveness concerns. Uh, the second that type of linking up here is an indirect link. Uh, so uh, the example that's usually given for this is where you have a common pool of offsets uh, so that uh, each program can pull from the same pool. The one with higher prices will have more of those offsets, which brings its prices down. The one, the program with lower prices for its allowances has access to fewer of those offsets, so its prices come up. And so you have some of this convergence in prices uh, without allowing the exchange of, of allowances from one program to another. 
And an example of this right now is the Australian and uh, EU programs, with, which both allow uh, CDM offsets to be used in their programs. And so uh, in addition to everything else that's going on with Australia, uh, right now they have an indirect link to the EU. And so that's an experience that's interesting, uh, in part by the fact that Australian uh, businesses, to the to best of my understanding, are not really taking advantage of that. They're not really using CDM offsets to comply. Uh, so there are some uh, social and behavioral aspects to these, as well as the economic ones that are worth considering. Uh, the second was also mentioned this morning, uh, linking by degrees. Uh, this is an idea that was really popularized with uh, Dallas Bertrand Clay Munning's paper, uh, I think it's two years ago now, uh, with the idea that um, there might be ways to align your programs incrementally as you approach full linking. For, uh, perhaps you start with an exchange of information, you could also align uh, some of the uh, mechanical aspects of the program, the registry and so forth. Uh, you could uh, adopt common offset protocols. And I'll point out that, uh, that some of this goes on perhaps even unintentionally. So we've, uh, I don't think that we've had uh, formal conversations with Reggie about linking by degrees, but we're, we're doing that a little bit. Reggie has adopted uh, a uh, price containment reserve that looks a lot like the California one. They've adopted protocols explicitly modeled on the California ones. And we can even uh, perhaps go the other direction and say that California's reserve price at auction was at least informed by, uh, if not modeled, necessarily modeled after the, the, the Reggie reserve price. So some of this linking by degrees is not necessarily uh, uh, deliberately al towards alignment, but it's an idea of just that by sharing information and learning from each other, you end up with programs that may be closer. Uh, the, the fourth on here is linking light. Um, this could be anything. It's ill-defined. It's sort of the category for ideas that, uh, that haven't yet been uh, published by Dallas Bertra. But it's, uh, <laughs> it has, uh, so for example, you could have, like with offsets, a limited quantity of allowances from another program that are allowed into yours. Um, or you could have uh, populate a price containment reserve with allowances from a lower price program so that under the circumstance that allowance prices were high, uh, you'd be able to draw from the other program. Uh, the idea here is that you get some of the benefits of, uh, of linking, but also only some of the risks. So, so you don't necessarily risk your price floor if you have linking light. Uh, you may not get full price convergence, but you get some price convergence. Is the, you know, does that meet the benefits? Are we willing to consider uh, sort of this impure form of linking? And then there might be others, and we're willing to consider uh, all sorts of others. And one that was mentioned this morning is unilateral links, which is not on this list, but certainly one that, uh, that's worth exploring in this broader conversation about what linking might look like as we look forward. Uh, so I, I promised a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, one is just that, really to reemphasize, and this has been said a couple times today, that in California, this is an environmental program and not a market program, or at least not primarily a market program. So a lot of the arguments uh, for linking uh, that rely on greater economic efficiency are important to us, and uh, there are certainly things that are considered, and there are strong arguments that we've made, but they may not be the deciding argument. They may not be dispositive. Uh, they may not compel us to link our program in the absence of some of the other ones, including political momentum. Uh, you know, the, the other, and this has been said again today too, but I think it bears repeating, is that our, really our first priority is to make the program work here. Uh, if it doesn't work here in California, then there's no linking conversation to be had. Nobody wants to be, to be associated with that or to have our program contaminate theirs. And so uh, I took a visit to China last year and I, I you had an opportunity to use the Deng Xiaoping quote about crossing the river while feeling for the stones. And that, uh, that idea of sort of moving deliberately where you move, you know, you move one hand at a time, one foot at a time, is really the way that California's approached the cap and trade program. We've delayed a couple of times in order to get it right rather than get it on time. And I think we can look at that for, for linking as well. And then uh, just to make a couple of, uh, of uh, contrarian points about the benefits of not linking, uh, the benefits of heterogeneity, that where a program uh, can be different but still respond to local circumstances or make it politically easier locally uh, or have design improvements, uh, then that heterogeneity, that lack of a link is actually beneficial uh, rather than, than detrimental. And one example of that is uh, the EU ETS doesn't have a price floor and we do. If we had adopted the EU ETS program, in order to make ours more linkable with theirs, I think we would have sacrificed something that's been really valuable in our program. So just an argument uh, for heterogeneity. 
And then the last point I make, I know I'm way, running way over time, uh, is that uh, it, there are other ways to think about linking that don't involve the exchange of allowances at all or even alignment of programs, uh, and that is that uh, we really think the California program can be a model. We want to model a, a strong environmental integrity, and for example, we think our offsets program is in, an example of that, where we're holding up an example uh, for others uh, to, uh, to try to, to, to match as well. Uh, you know, we want to model that a strong climate policies uh, are compatible with a strong economy and, in fact, can really, uh, can really benefit a strong economy. And then we also have uh, innovative technologies that are advanced here in California. When those are exported, when those are used somewhere else, uh, that's, that's linking, uh, perhaps not through a policy mechanism, but it's linking of the ability to make these reductions in a way that's beneficial. And lastly, you know, there are other innovations, not just technologies, uh, but things like uh, solar financing that were developed here in response to California opportunities and policies that have been since exported to, to great benefit other places. So with that, I'll close. Uh, thank you for your patience, and I look forward to the discussion. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, Erica Morehouse with Environmental Defense Fund, um, and really appreciate being invited here um, to talk about this really timely and interesting topic. Um, so I, I really want to kind of echo the, the comments that Mark made in terms of um, we, we view California's program and California and Quebec's program really as the launch pad for international action on, on climate change. So our primary goal um, at EDF is an environmental goal. That, that's the bottom line, getting the environmental benefit that we're seeking and avoiding catastrophic climate change. Um, and so we really think about everything in, in terms of the lens of creating a, a model for, for climate action. Um, and this is just a map. I know we've seen another, another map um, today, but um, from a project that EDF is engaged in with the International Emissions Trading Association, um, where we're providing information about um, case studies on the different uh, market-based systems around the world. Um, and so I, it's worth noting that 10% um, of the world's population is currently uh, lives in a place where there's a carbon market, and that's a third of global GDP. Um, so clearly we're, we're at the beginning, but um, starting to see a lot of opportunities, and that's kind of where this next map goes to, um, is, is the fact that we are really at the beginning, um, and it really is kind of an adventure that we're engaging in with Quebec in terms of linkages, because there aren't a lot of linkages out there. Um, you know, the European Union is, is a large uh, conglomeration of 27 countries working together, but we're really sort of forging um, this this uh, pathway of 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 linking to a, a another program in another country with um, a, a different currency and a lot of a lot of complicated pieces to work out, as we've discussed today. Um, so I won't go into this too much in detail, um, but it. I think it's just it's worth there's some noting some of the indirect linkages um, with Australia and the EU as as Mark noted, um, and I think it really shows that we're at the beginning and there's a lot of opportunity out there um, for the bottom up kind of action that we've really been talking about today, um, and so just moving on to I I mentioned the case study tool just so that everyone everyone knows that this is out there um, we're <coughs> continually updating uh, the case studies um, from these different uh, market programs that are out there and it is available on our website as well as AIDA's website. Um, and it pr it, the case studies may provide you more information that you really want to know about every program, but they talk a lot about the different components that we've discussed today. Um, everything from allowance allocation to what's covered under the program, what gas is, um, what sectors of the economy. So, so it's kind of a way to explore and see where some of the opportunities um, for those kind of harmonizations are or the opportunities I think that um, Mark really aptly pointed out the opportunities for laboratories of experimentation and, and the fact that there may actually be some benefits to the fact that there are differences out there um, that are really being explored. Um, and, and so Again, with this theme of, of opportunity, I think um, this figure, which really shows the um, 
where the top emitters in the world are um, kind of does show that the United States and China are kind of the holy grails of opportunity and, and where we need to take action because they, there are so many emissions coming from those sectors. And I think California and Quebec are a real um, beacon of hope in, in terms of the United States and being as well as Reggie and being able to create um, those models. Um, and, and China, as was mentioned, is, is doing the seven pilot projects, which really, I think, takes this um, idea of laboratories of experimentation. Each of the seven programs, as I understand it, is, is taking a little bit of a different pro approach within China. Um, and so, so China is exploring what works for them as a developing economy that's really moving very quickly and you know, has a lot of different challenges in developing an emissions trading um, system than the EU or than California did. Um, so, so we're working um, in China and see a lot of opportunity there, although we recognize that it really is very much at a beginning stage and kind of at the stage with California that would be more of an information sharing kind of link um, if, we're, if we're characterizing um, the, t the type of linkage uh, that, that is taking place and that we really need an opportunity to let that program grow, let it learn by doing um, a little bit. Um, and the, the point I wanted to make here, this goes back to um, a study that, that EDF did on um, lessons learned from the EU ETS. Um, and we talk a lot about California being able to provide information to other jurisdictions um, and, and that being a beneficial process. And California, in fact, was able to take advantage of that um, beneficial process itself. Um, being able to learn from the experiences that the, the EU had um, where they, they faced challenges and were really able to address those challenges in many cases, and California was able to um, take those lessons and apply them. Um, and I, f I felt like this was particularly relevant to the conversation on linkage because I think it, it would inform what how California evaluates other um, programs that, that it's considering linking with in any, in any form. Um, and also the type of information that it would pass on. So I think the, the big takeaway um, for me was really about the actual and measured emissions reduction, so mandatory reporting and verification, um, and the fact that California did begin doing that in 2008 and start its cap and trade program until 2013, whereas the EU really did take this kind of learning by doing process, um, and, and its first compliance period was based on uh, projected emissions rather than actual emissions, um, but that was changed in future periods. Um, the second piece that I felt like was important, which has been discussed a little bit today, was offsets. I think that California has taken its responsibility to um, create the most uh, scientifically, uh, the offsets with the most scientific integrity very seriously, um, and will only adopts protocols um, that really address these issues of um, leakage risk and also um, the transparency, the administrability of a program, um, which is really enf enhanced by that protocol process. Um, EDF has, has joined the state in actually defending against lawsuits on um, the offsets protocols um, that have been upheld so far because California has taken this very um, measured and careful approach to offsets, and I think that's something we would we would recommend that California, and I would imagine California would take very seriously um, in evaluating uh, any other jurisdiction. Um, and finally, pricing stability. We've talked a lot about the different um, components that affect pricing stability, but um, and I think the allowance price containment reserve has already been mentioned, but this is one of those great examples of California had an innovative way to keep prices in check, and it's really being taken and adapted in its own ways by Reggie and by the EU already. Um, so I'll just move on. And, and to say that we, I often hear in, in California, I think the EU tends to be a little bit of a scapegoat, um, but that's not really the way that we um, see the EU at, at EDF. Um, it, the EU did achieve 4% of emissions reductions between 2007 and 2010, and um, the analysis of correlation shows that some of that, but not by any means all of it, was um, 
caused by the, by the recession, and a lot of it can be attributed to the cap and trade program, despite the challenges um, that the EU did face. So I think the, the message there is there really is a benefit from just taking action and learning by doing. Um, and so I think that's maybe something we can take to the Chinese context um, and the other contexts of really experimentation out there um, that we can try and do the best the best that we can, but um, there really just is benefit in, in sort of taking that step and, and taking action. <clears throat> um, so, so moving on um, kind of to EDF's perspective on the California program itself, um, that we, there's one of the messages that has really been resonating is this idea about whether the, the environment versus economy is really a false choice. We don't have to choose between um, economic uh, progress and our environment and our health. Um, so EDF um, put out a report in January that was about the first year of cap and trade implementation and why we've seen it as a success. Um, and this is really, one of the pieces that I think um, uh, Matt Kahn mentioned this morning, there's, there's really powerful message around jobs and um, creating a green economy. And despite what a lot of the sort of sky was, is falling predictions that were made before the cap and trade program started, California was, is actually leading the nation in economic recovery, in including job growth um, in a lot of different metrics. Um, the state was able to, pass, to balance its budget for the first time since 2008. Um, unemployment fell from 9.8 um, to 8.5%, uh, raising the minimum wage. And since um, AB 32 was passed in uh, 2006, we've had over $20 billion in clean energy investment. And that's definitely a nation leader um, and has really grown the green economy in California. Um, it, a million new jobs since cap and trade was passed in 2010. Um, and so we're, California is really creating this resilient green economy. Um, green jobs, um, the analysis shows, are, grow about 10 times faster than jobs in traditional sectors, and they've also proven to be more resilient during times of economic downturn. So we're really sort of creating an economy that um, is the economy of the future. And, and finally, just going into the other components um, of cap and trade that, that we have about, uh, considered to be successful. And um, the success of cap and trade, I think, really will feed into this, whether it becomes a model of climate action, whether it does encourage replication. Um, and the reason that we do see it as successful is the six, six auctions that we've had so far, there's been um, high participation from business. Um, there's been a relatively stable market price. Um, in, the, in the most recent um, auctions in California, all of the allowances that are offered for the future that actually can't be used for several more years um, have sold out, which means that, that businesses are really starting to believe that this program is durable, it's around to stay, and they're, um, they're acting uh, in that manner. Um, and I think just the, the linkage with Quebec itself um, is viewed as a metric of success as um, both Quebec and California showing that they can do more together, they can broaden their market um, and, and work together and achieve more together than they could apart. Um, and there's, there's also always a lot of discussion about allowance prices, whether they're low in the EU, whether they're low in California. Um, but, I mean, we don't really see low or close to the floor emissions reductions as a bad thing. It's really just an indicator that emissions reductions are less costly than once expected um, before the program started. And that um, is one of, the, one of the big benefits of cap and trade is that we don't have to um, pay more for emissions reductions than are required. And finally, just to say that um, we uh, polled other market experts um, in, in completing our one-year report, so that it wasn't just EDF, um, and they were overwhelmingly positive about um, the program that California has, um, the citing markets as a, the auctions as a bright spot, um, and also really thinking about the future. I mean, California, um, is actually on track to meet its 2020 goals, 
Um, and the conversation is really turning to what happens next. Um, we obviously have a lot of milestones left to achieve, but I think that the market experts, um, from what we heard, we're already starting to think about um, the benefits from certainty and the benefits about thinking about what, what happens next. So um, I will just leave you with that thought. Good afternoon, everyone. When uh, our panel had a, a brief discussion on the phone a while ago, uh, I sort of saw my role on the panel, at least from our discussion, as being the one who would be a bit of a wet blanket um, and less enthusiastic about what the prospects were to extend, extend beyond. Uh, but it's, it's been kind of a fun process for me just thinking a lot more about this, and I'm going to sound more positive than, uh, than I, <laughs> when I did on the phone. I'm telling my panel members. So that probably takes away the sparks we were hoping to have. Um, but I'm going to really focus on c other Canadian jurisdictions. And, but I am keen, if it comes out in questioning, to, to, if people know more about, for example, or the state of Oregon and Washington and, and, and whether anything is going on there, I can speak uh, more um, about the Canadian situation, of course. And one of the themes that will come out um, in my brief talk uh, is the, uh, that I, I would argue that we can see that energy diversity in Canada uh, also reflects climate policy diversity, and that's probably no surprise to anyone. And uh, even earlier today, someone was talking about what would be the effect on um, the economy of, I don't know if you forget it was Illinois or whatever, about you know a carbon-based economy versus a hydro-based economy. So uh, I'll, I'm going to go through the four provinces in Canada, I won't say much about Quebec, of course, we've been talking about Quebec, but uh, the provinces that together represent, I think, about 90% or over 85% of the Canadian population. Um, with Alberta, it's uh, fossil fuel rich with oil sands, we know that, and it's electricity system, natural gas, and coal, especially coal-fired power. In 2007, it developed an emission intensity standard for industry. Uh, in order to preempt what they saw as federal regulations coming on at that time, uh, although those regulations still have not yet happened. Uh, and, and the basic characteristics of it are a permit fee. This is an emission intensity standard, right? So it's not absolute emissions. It's the rate at which emissions per barrel of oil, if you're in the oil, oil industry, or emissions per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. So the rate at which the emissions intensity falls over time. And we know in industry it does fall over time. So uh, it's going to be, whether or not that constraint is binding uh, will really depend uh, on how you say that rate of decline must occur. And I'm not going to give you all the details, but if you don't meet that rate of decline, then you need to buy permits, and there's also an offset program, but you need to buy permits at $15 a ton or purchase permits from someone else in industry who was able to get theirs to decline faster than that rate. So you, you have a permit trading market in Alberta uh, since that time. Um, and th this is, I just want to mention a couple of other comments on that because uh, often in debates in Canada about who has emissions pricing and who doesn't have emissions pricing. It's also taught me to be um, very careful about the meaning of words. Uh, so we, we get into discussions about does Alberta have emissions pricing or not. My point will be that uh, most of its emissions are not priced at all in industry. And if the, if the this is almost like an offsets question, the world that would have occurred, if that decline would have been greater than what the government regulation asks for, then it's a non-binding constraint and really it's paying uh, nothing. Now, as it is right now, they, there is money that's paid at $15, so we know the constraint was binding and there's amount of money that builds up. But the estimates that I've gotten, even from working with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, is that if you were to have an existing oil sands plant and want to modify it or build a new one, the actual price would not be $15 per ton, but would work out, or, or $15 per ton of CO2, would work out more to like $3 uh, per ton of CO2 on average. So this is a, someone says to you, we, got a, we have an emissions pricing regime as well, and it's 
this amount of money, you really have to ask, how is it applied in that jurisdiction compared to a jurisdiction that has cap and trade that's covering all emissions in some kind of absolute sense? And therefore, as someone else mentioned this morning, there are some challenges about one day trying to connect the two systems. Um, I'm sure clever people could come up with some way to do that, but that would be a, certainly a challenge. Um, in British Columbia, where I'm from, hydroelectric power dominant, and now though we're, we're being challenged with shale gas and very large shale gas resources. In 2007 to 2008, the government set an aggressive emissions target. And people will say to me, oh, so, and I was an advisor to the, the premier and his deputy minister in that process. And they'll say to me, well, um, you're the jurisdiction that has the carbon tax in North America. And they'll say, how did you ever get that to happen? And I explained to them that the premier, who had a good economics background and was a bit of a policy wonk, in this case really just took a shotgun approach. He said, I want everything, anything anyone's, if Arnold Schwarzenegger is doing it, even if, he's, if the French are doing it, I want us to try that. So we have a low carbon fuel standard and a, a zero emission electricity standard and a carbon tax, and we have passed enabling legislation for cap and trade uh, around the same time, I think, as Quebec was doing that or if not before, we went very fast. Um, and the, the clean electricity standard is the most aggressive that I know of in the world. It basically says you can't build anything that emits greenhouse gases. Now you can say, well, you're a hydropower system. Actually, it's very difficult for us to build new hydropower, and we probably won't. We had two coal plants and a natural gas plant that already had signed contracts uh, with BC Hydro, the, the main utility, and all of those were canceled because of this particular policy that came in in January 2007. The carbon tax uh, is an economist's dream, um, and uh, it was fun to be in on the ground floor on that. We said things like, uh, well, maybe make it revenue neutral, uh, you know, thinking about the macroeconomic implications, so the, all the revenue, we try to track it and it comes back as personal and corporate income tax cuts. We also said set it at one level and have it rise over time. So it was rising in $5 increments to reach uh, $30 per ton in 2012. And in 2008, 2009, I was the chief advisor to a group that was saying where would the price go from 2012 to 2020, and then of course the recession came on and people lost interest in that. So we almost got something embedded there, although I think there'd be an, a motive for governments to uh, overturn that in today's world, because I think it would have been uh, over $100 by 2020 was what the panel had agreed on. So, um, so we, 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 we passed this enabling legislation on cap and trade, and um, Although this is such irony for me, at the time in 2006, 2007, I was advising that we do cap and trade because I thought politically it would be very difficult with the carbon tax. Uh, the Premier went with the carbon tax, almost got defeated on that carbon tax alone, but barely re-won an election. Then when the opportunity came to join the California cap and trade, I was among a group of people who advised the governments not to join it right away. And there's various reasons for that. And one of them is we're now at $30 a ton for all combustion-related CO2 emissions. In, right, so it's an economy-wide carbon tax. And you know, we had a real worry that suddenly industry would go from paying $30 down to whatever your floor price is. Uh, and so I, was, I, so I think what we ended up saying was, well, when their floor price gets to $30. Uh, so I heard today that it might go up at 5% a year, maybe it's around $10 or 11 or 12. And I was trying to do the calculus. So in 40 years, we will join the California cap and trade. I, I'm not sure what the, um, how exactly that'll unfold, but that's a challenge for linking across like that. But I wouldn't rule it out. Um, there's, there is still some real interest in this in British Columbia. Ontario, diverse electricity system, no major oil or gas resources. Uh, it has been the biggest driver causing greenhouse gas emissions uh, in Canada. And I, you know, Quebec has done good work, British Columbia has done good work, but in fact, Ontario uh, committed in 2003 to phase out its coal plants. And the motive was to do with air quality and, and acid emissions, actually, but uh, slowly that morphed into, oh, look what we're doing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as well. And now those plants are almost completely phased out. Uh, it joined WCI with Quebec and, and British Columbia, but today this is seen as politically risky. Um, they don't have the majority government they once had, and they, they won't have, we heard this morning, where there's sort of a consensus in Quebec 
no matter where one is on the political spectrum. And you certainly, uh, and you don't have that in Ontario, and nor do we have that, as I'm going to explain in a minute, at the federal level in Canada. So if, if uh, but there are parties there. Uh, the current governing party says it favors emissions pricing and cap and trade still, and so do the Social Democrats, who are a, quite a strong party. Quebec, um, I won't talk about, other than to say that the, the interesting issue is why is Quebec staying the course? And in a way, my question here, uh, strong consensus in Quebec on climate action. I didn't even know it was as strong as was explained to us this morning. And also, one has to understand Quebec's uh, sense of uniqueness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Canada. So it's not like uh, you, you know, a Quebec politician has to go to people in Quebec and, and explain why they're doing something different than other parts of Canada. I mean, there's a certain pride to say <laughs> we're doing something different than the rest of Canada. And there's nothing wrong with linking up with Americans as well. Uh, sort of Quebec is a unique fact in North, North America. I'll, my last slide now is on um, the Canadian federal government. And um, now I, I, I am someone that when the current government was elected in 2006, they hired me as an advisor to the environment minister and they appointed me to a, a bigger national advisory board and we focused on climate called the National Roundtable. Um, but as things have evolved, I've become quite a vocal critic of our federal government in Canada, the current government. But Madeline's put me on best behavior and uh, <laughs> considering our audience. So anyway, assume that anything I say that's uh, negative uh, would have been even stronger. Um, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the advertisements that I watch or, and hear incessantly until I finally just stopped listening to radios and television are our current federal government in Canada uh, says, or its party, the Conservative Party, does ads continually that a cap and trade of any kind is like is a carbon tax that will destroy economies and hurt everyone. So I guess that's their judgment on what you're doing here in California today uh, and what Quebec is doing. And yet I want to point out in these final slides that um, the U.S. government, uh, especially at the federal level, can influence Canadian climate policy quite strongly. First of all, we have an election in 2015, and the current federal government was elected with 39% of the votes, because in Canada, it's not a two-party system. Uh, you can get a majority government with, well, obviously, with less than 40% of the votes. So you have a majority, uh, but you know those other 60% were split in different ways. The parties who split those, those votes, the Social Democrats, the Liberals, what was a bloc from Quebec, and uh, the Greens, all want emissions pricing. All, that's part of their platform. And going into the next federal election, uh, both the, ma the two major parties, the Liberals and the Social Democrats, have said that again. So, uh, so, so first of all, that's a possibility. But also, it's, it's politically unacceptable in some ways to have a weaker climate policy in Canada than in the US, and once the US is acting. But does that mean we would act, the Canadian federal government would act because of California? Uh, I, that certainly I can't see that happening in emissions pricing as long as the current government is there. And so that's why you'd have to, you'd have to be thinking about a different government in 2015 for that to happen. And they both promised, uh, the two main parties have promised national cap and trade. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. So, um, so thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks to all the hard work organizing the conference. Um, Last, last presentation of the day, and I think I've also been transformed into being more optimistic. So a lot of um, what I, I'll say, I, I had planned on, on speaking a little bit more about the durability, questions of durability and resiliency and, and challenges for durability moving forward on a cap and trade policy in, in North America. Um, but I do have slides on that, and we can talk about, a little bit about that in the discussion. What I'm going to focus on today um, is the, well, the presentation is called The Political Viability of Cap and Trade, California, Quebec, and Canada, U.S. Compared. And it's based on, I'm taking a little bit of a different track. I'm going to look at some recent public opinion data that's, uh, or polling data that's been done um, uh, simultaneously using the same survey instrument in Canada and the United States to see what um, the public thinks about cap and trade um, and a series of other questions. So my talk will focus and I think this is the old version of the presentation, but that's okay. Um, I hope it's not. Okay, um, the, 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 my talk will focus on what are the prospects of linking cap and trade systems across North American jurisdictions. And what I'm gonna do is to answer that question or to, to dig into that question, I wanna look at um, 
the distribution of opinion, uh, of public opinion on cap and trade across different state and, and uh, provincial groupings. Um, I also want to, um, maybe I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but why does public opinion matter? So what, what, what's the relevance of the data I'm presenting today? Uh, well, I think there are a few reasons, and I think a great example is what happened here in California with uh, Proposition uh, 23 and the, um, the, the amount of public support that was required uh, to save um, AB 32. And so public opinion is obviously very, very important. It's also important at a more general level in the sense that um, everything we do, uh, almost, heating our homes, traveling, getting to and from work, involves some sort of carbon emissions. And so um, necessarily, we need to change our behaviors. And if individuals are going to change their behaviors, we have to understand of how they think about these problems and what they're prepared to do. Uh, we also know that changing behavior imposes some kind of a cost. So the understanding of willingness to pay and, and public support for policies that impose costs on, on the public uh, is important. Um, so we'll be looking at some of the data that kind of get, gives us a, a sense of where the public stands on uh, carbon pricing mechanisms and global warming more generally. Uh, and the final, what, what does the public know and think with respect to cap and trade is, is where um, I'll focus. I also, um, if the slides are, are here, I will also speak to um, you know, how to build resilient and durable institutions based on the data we have. So really quickly on methodology, I won't bore you with this, just all this to say that we ran two random prob probability samples uh, in the fall of 2013, ident almost identical fielding dates. Um, the key difference, uh, we also included landline and cell phones in both samples. The key difference though is in the um, sample size, uh, which we have the margins of error here and, and the sample size. So notice that there were 1,500 uh, Canadians who were polled. And what I, so I was able to, um, I should also say that this is some collaborative research with uh, Barry Rabe at the University of Michigan and Chris Boric at Muhlenberg College. And I should also recognize the um, support from Canada 2020 that funded the Canadian version of um, the, the, the survey. Um, with that money, we were able to pull 1,500 Canadians. So I have it, we have at least 300 observations in all of the major provinces that Mark went over. So, um, Quebec, Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario. And that allows us to make some really interesting comparisons within a reasonable margin of error to look for stati statistically significant differences. Now, we also, we, we have 948 observations in the United States, which allows for a good a sense of, um, you know, nationally representative within a, a margin of error of three, three and a half percent. What's really interesting, though, is what you're going to see, um, I ha despite the fact that um, it's a relatively small sample size when you break things down by state. Uh, the differences are so big that some of them are statistically significant. So um, that will be interesting to look at, and I'll point that out when that's the case. Uh, a good place to start when looking at um, climate change beliefs or climate change opinions is to look at core beliefs. And obviously one of the biggest questions, especially in the United States, um, uh, because there's no consensus, uh, despite what some other pollsters say, on uh, whether or not climate change is happening, global warming is happening. And here what's interesting is also to note the difference between California and Quebec on this question, which is statistically significant. So on the, the first bar, the, the flags, we asked, is there solid evidence that the average temperature on Earth has been getting warmer over the past four decades? And we see that there's no real difference between California with respect to the national average, but um, Quebecers are much more uh, likely to believe that global warming is happening. Also, we, um, we follow up that question amongst believers only uh, and ask that, is the earth getting warmer because of human activity such as burning fossil fuels or mostly because of, of natural patterns? And only one in four Americans believe that it's, um, it's happening due to natural factors and that number is nearly double in Quebec. So there are some differences uh, at the level of core beliefs. This is just a breakdown of the United, United States opinions by um, regional categories, I'll say. So, the, the US, we have the USA total on the left, California um, in, in the middle. Uh, I, we compare that to the Reggie uh, re respondents who, who live in, who, who come from um, Reggie states. The WCI departed are the WCI members that kind of 
um, didn't fully implement the WCI. And the, the thing that jumps out here, and this difference is statistically significant, is that people coming from the WCI departed states are si significantly less likely than people from California to believe in global warming and to believe that humans are the natural, or humans are the cause. Um, this is the distribution of opinions in Canada, and I, I don't want to spend too much time because I have a lot of material. Um, but just note here that Alberta, people in Alberta are significantly less likely than people in Quebec to believe that global warming is happening and also to uh, attribute that um, phenomenon to human activity. And the same thing is true for Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which are two separate provinces which I had to combine just to get a reasonable sample size. But together, uh, I can, we find uh, or we note a statistically significant difference between people, in people coming from Manitoba and Saskatchewan and uh, people from Quebec. So um, getting right to, I guess, the meat of the issue is what are um, people's attitudes and uh, opinions on cap and trade? And this is probably, for me, uh, one of the most telling slides I'll, I'll show today. And this is just a question where we actually first describe what cap and trade is, and that's the text in blue. So. Uh, we, we asked respondents, there is a proposed system called cap and trade where the government issues permits limiting the amount of greenhouse gases companies can put out. The idea is that many companies find ways to put out less greenhouse gases because that is cheaper than buying permits. Have you heard a lot about this system, a little or not at all? And it's pretty surprising to say that even somewhere like California, 42% of the population has heard um, nothing about cap and trade. Um, so clearly, uh, this is what I would call an information challenge um, and, and it's really important to point out because lacking knowledge of what cap and trade is um, it's really easy uh, for for misinformation campaigns or for misleading campaigns uh, to, to call it a tax as was done by the Conservative Party in Canada to kind of um, counter frame and um, to counter frame this policy and to um, to frame it as something that it's actually not also, uh, when people in 2015, when um, people start realizing that they're, um, uh, they're paying more at the pump for gasoline, um, it'd be nice that they know what kind of policy this is and that they can support it and understand why and the rationale for this policy. Now, looking at support for cap and trade, again, across the same regional categories, we note that California, Californians are significantly more likely than the rest of people in the United States to support cap and trade. We follow up uh, the, a general question asking how much do you support with what if the cap and trade program significantly lowered greenhouse gas emissions but raised your monthly energy costs by $15 a month? And that $15 a month isn't just some arbitrary number. It, it's actually based on EPA estimates of the waxman markey um, which put it at 150, about $150 a year, so roughly $15 a month. And what we note is a very small and marginal change in people's support for cap and trade at that level. The situation is uh, similar, but um, the problem is more acute in Canada, where in Quebec, the, the province with cap and trade, 58% of respondents report not having heard of, uh, cap and trade, of the cap and trade program or of the idea of cap and trade, which, is, which again underscores the importance of public sensitization and um, knowledge outreach and engaging the, the public. It also points to, as a political scientist, um, I do a lot of work on policy uh, as well, and you know, one of the things is, is the public ahead or behind? Is, the public, is public opinion pushing government on this issue? And here we see that when it comes to cap and trade, it's very much driven by policy makers and not public opinion demanding this policy. Um, interesting to note, though, that in Canada, uh, once um, we price the policy at $15 a month and people realize that the sky is not falling down with respect to this policy, uh, support increases for cap and trade. Um, so uh, a logical question we can ask is who supports cap and trade and what, on what basis can we build public support? Um, so I did this uh, really quickly. Um, uh, it's basically a regression uh, analysis looking at where the dependent variable is the probability of support for cap and trade, so basically the distribution on the variable we just looked at. And uh, a few things jump out, and by the way, this is run on the U.S. data only. A few things that really jump out, um, first of all, 
uh, at looking at the bottom, the cap and trade variable, whether or not a respondent um, comes from a state with cap and trade, so the re either the Reggie states or California, has no, are, they're not any more or less likely to support cap and trade than the rest of Americans. And you can look at that um, through a positive lens or a negative lens, but uh, we'll look at it positively and we'll say that that means there's, um, there's opportunities for linkage in non cap and trade states. Similarly, being a, a resident of California makes you no more likely to support cap and trade than non Californian residents. Again, we can look at that as an opportunity for linkage. But what I really want to point to um, are the, the significant variables. So that, those are the variables that, uh, for which the confidence intervals don't cross the, the zero. Um, belief in global warming, so the type of belief uh, we have. Um, so those who believe that climate change is caused by human activity, uh, some combination, or who believe in climate change but aren't sure of its primary cause, um, are all significantly more likely to support cap and trade. So it's one thing to, um, you know, we always make the distinction between uh, people who believe that average global temperatures are, are, are warming versus people who do not perceive that. Well, what's also important is the reason for believing. So if we believe that it's due to natural patterns or well, particularly natural patterns, we're less likely to support cap and trade. So the type of belief is also important. The other thing I wanted to point out is knowledge. Here we see that the more knowledgeable you are about cap and trade, recall that variable on how much have you heard about cap and trade, significantly impacts um, the propensity to support cap and trade. And this is just a, a, a graphical depiction of the uh, predicted probability of supporting cap and trade at different values of that knowledge variable. And here we see that people who know a little, who report knowing a little or a lot about cap and trade, are significantly more likely to support it. So that underscores um, what I was saying earlier about the fact that people have not heard about cap and trade is a problem, and it's a problem for support for cap and trade. So one of the take home messages I'd like to drive home is that uh, the public should should be more engaged in, in knowing about this policy and understanding what its reason is and being tuned into what the benefits are if it's going to be, uh, if we expect it to be resilient. And just to give an order of magnitude, people who know a lot of cap and trade are about twice as likely than people who have not heard about it at all to support cap and trade. Um, we've also polled um, in the past asking people well, what if we're going to do this policy, regardless of your support, we're going to do it anyway. We're going to put a price on carbon. And where would you prefer that the money be spent? And this is a distribution of opinion on what uh, the public believes, um, uh, the, where the public would like the money to be spent. And the different response categories are invested in alternative energy and research and development, tax rebates, payroll tax cuts, deficit reduction, don't do it. <laughs> Uh, sustain existing programs and not sure. And overwhelmingly what we find is support for targeted investment in alternative energy, research and development. And this might not be the preferred uh, approach of economists uh, who might prefer, you know, um, the double, looking for the double dividend and uh, reducing dis other distortions in the tax system, uh, taking the BC approach, which is you know, tax rebates and payroll tax cuts, which, which there is some support for, and there, there are good economic reasons, uh, efficiency reasons to do that. But what we do see is that there's overwhelming support for uh, investing that and targeting that money in alternative energy and research and development. Um, so that's another take home message. Um, and so I also ask the question, is there an efficiency feasibility trade off? So just to conclude, um, I have more slides and be happy to, to unpack some of this with you in the discussion, but um, despite support in Quebec and California, there's lack of public understanding and knowledge of uh, this policy. And this leaves the public vulnerable to counterframing and misleading information um, by uh, opponents of this policy. So it's important to get that message out there. Um, how do we build individual support? Well, we've seen that information plays a crucial, crucial role in shaping um, public acceptability of uh, cap and trade, and that there's a need to better engage and inform the public on what the policy is and what its advantages are. Uh, how to build resilient, car resilient carbon markets? Um, I think 
the data clearly tell us, and uh, I think it's important to note, that clear, transparent, and fair use of revenue uh, can, and mm. that shows, that demonstrates what the benefits are, can help build constituency support. And we've already s started talking about this, and it's just a point I wanted to bring up, but I, I think we've already mentioned it. Uh, you know, um, whether or not the intergovernmental context, the, 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 uh, whether or not the Clean Air Act might incentivize or provide a new incentive for states to uh, join cap and trade. So those are the ends of my re remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank our speakers for these uh, very interesting presentation, uh, presentations. And I'd like to just throw out one question and then open it up to the, the floor. Uh, so I really just wanted to ask you all the question about developing country linkages. So. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, for many of you may know that 90% of the growth in emissions is expected to come from the developing world, China, India, Russia, uh, and other developing countries. And so I, I'm wondering what you think are the opportunities uh, for linkage in particular with the developing countries where you might have capacity and resource limitations. And I know at least the two marks have done work with China, so I'm particularly interested in what you have to say with China given my own research, but welcome your thoughts on, uh, on, on uh, developing countries in general. Okay. Um, in in Canada, our federal government uh, talks about it's it's a supporter of a global agreement on greenhouse gas emissions, and um, unfortunately, some of us who are frustrated with its actions see that sort of as a cover, which is we will do things when the rest of the planet is doing it all simultaneously, which of course is an impossibility, and so we can go on rapidly expanding uh, fossil fuel production as we're doing in Canada. But what, what I say to counter that is that we do indeed need to make, sh we need to act domestically in the United States, in Canada, in individual jurisdictions, and then anytime we're designing any po policy, we need to be thinking about what its influence can be on other countries and regions. And those influences are going to be, or should be in my view, both carrots and sticks, because we are in a global free rider problem. Uh, the EU uh, set up its uh, uh, cap and trade system so that offsets could be purchased in developing countries and while I have a lot of problems with the true additionality of offsets and some research that's been done on that uh, would, would, would back that, I nonetheless can support it to the extent that it, um, um, you know, that it is bringing technology and financing for, uh, for low emission or zero emission uh, technologies. But I argue that such a policy uh, should also say and, and you know tie strings to to that money. Um, to what extent is your country implementing uh, policies that are moving, for example, experimental cap and trade, and you have a game plan of how they're going to expand out? I do notice, but w when the United States has had various cap and trade bills, and I once had a student examine all the different ones that had gone through from about. 90, you know, had, had never not been implemented, but had come somewhat along the way, McCain, Lieberman, um, and of course Waxman Markey that did go through. And their analysis showed that almost every bill, Senate and House, there was a few that didn't, but almost every one of these proposed bills had a policy in there that said, or a clause in there that said, if countries exporting into the United States uh, didn't have a comparable, comparable policy or effect on emissions pricing in 10 years or something like that, that our policy or our administrator of our cap and trade system would then have to set up a way in which people had to buy permits uh, associated with their imports into the United States. That would be very difficult and complex to do, but I support that very strongly. And so I, and I'm interested in whether California could start to do that. I am interested in all policy should be think. It's harder for a, a non, a subnational jurisdiction, but all policy should be thinking about how are we creating carrots and sticks for other traders. It's a global problem. It does nothing to say, look how great we are. We're reducing our emissions, but we're not affecting the rest of the world. Yeah, I would just say that we're we're really encouraged by what we see happening in China. The uh, national government and the seven pilots are are really serious about implementing their cap and trade programs. And the the last time I did a webinar for one of our partners, they were asking about linkage among those programs and then what it meant to meet your own targets if there was trading across borders. So I think I think they're taking it very seriously. I I, I at this point I don't see 
uh, at least any immediate prospects for linkage uh, between uh, California and China, in part because of some of the reasons that you pointed out about uh, uh, you know, transparency and governance, and uh, you know, we really do see one, the, the role that we, among uh, many ETSs, play uh, as being uh, re really setting the gold standard on environmental integrity and offsets and, and other things. And so, uh, I think that we would we would really only consider linkage with with programs that uh, looked comparable to us in that way, and, and that's written into statute now in California. Uh, both that the stringency and enforceability of a program have to be comparable before the governor can allow linking to go forward. Hmm. If I, yeah, yeah just I would I would agree with um, Mark's comments on China and just point out that another opportunity I think to watch really is in the deforestation sector, which is a big part of the developing world. Um, deforestation around the world creates more emissions than the transportation sector, um, so there really is kind of a need to create. Um, value for forests and have forests be uh, worth more alive than, than dead. And that is um, a, an opportunity that EDF is exploring through RED, which was mentioned, I think, once today, um, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, and it's not um, something that California has directly considered, but I think it's something that's, that's still on the table. Um, so that is would be an offset opportunity, not not kind of a direct linkage, um, but I think there are there are these sort of possibilities for creating um, connections, uh, maybe if if depending on how you you define linkage. Um. And the only thing I would add to that is, um, uh, and it's it's the obvious point, but I mean, if if uh, looking where to link, I think the the the. The best partners, at least in theory, are your trade partners or people who, in which uh, you know you might have competitiveness concerns. So, in the case of China, I think China is an obvious target for linkage. But um, uh, whether or not the capacity is there, whether or not the the the, the rules are can be harmonized uh, as quickly as they need to, that's the that's the big challenge. Mm 